Hi there, I'm Carolyn Rosé, the Director of Dance, and uh, this was meant to be uh, the second talk in our online talk series that uh, was meant to be conducted over Hangouts on the Air, but we had some technical difficulties this morning, and so I'm re-recording it now for you. And uh, the topic of this talk is going to be about the work that my research group at Carnegie Mellon has been doing in the area of uh, building uh, interventions that are meant to support collaborative learning in different settings that um, are motivated by work that we have done on analytics applied to discourse. Um, so let's, uh, let's go ahead and dive right in. Um, first, let me just remind you a little bit about what dance as an organization is meant to enable or achieve. We are partnering with edX. We are a satellite underneath their umbrella um, open source effort. And what we are hoping to contribute is platform extensions that would enable the following things. Project and problem-based learning, collaborative reflection and collaborative problem solving, community building and social support around MOOCs and also um, collections of MOOCs. Um, for the purpose of reducing attrition and also working towards engaging underrepresented students in online education, but also to think about MOOCs kind of more broadly, not just courses that exist for a short amount of time, but sort of gateways to enduring communities of practice where students continue to learn together and support each other's learning as they take what they've learned and apply it in practice and then come back together to uh, help each other to, to move on and deepen their knowledge and skills. And so we uh, have been doing research in a related area of computer-supported collaborative learning for many years now, but this effort, this dance effort, is meant to be a community-wide effort, not just specific to the research that my group has been doing and continues to do, but bringing together researchers internationally who are doing related work, also course developers, designers, um, people who build uh, advanced technologies that could be used as part of interventions in a MOOC context. We want to build this community to come together to form a common vision for what these platform extensions can be so that we can develop resources that will be generally useful. So if you're watching this talk, you probably already know about our dance webpage, but I want to point out that we have made some recent extensions. So uh, in addition to being able to use the website to join our effort um, by signing up for our mailing list or finding out about our continuing talk series, we've now added a resources page, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the resources we've already collected together. You can see based on the... Um, uh, 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 icons at the bottom of the screen that we now have Google Groups and a Twitter account, a Facebook account, a Google Group account, an Instagram account. And all of this social media is meant to make a place where we can start to put together some resources that are generally useful for the community that we're trying to assemble here. So we started a uh, our first community level event um, was a group brainstorming event on Google Hangouts on the air and about 11 people attended the, the, um, the, the formal Hangout on the air session and others were watching passively. And in that discussion, uh, we also had some Google Docs where we were collecting notes with the ideas of what people were thinking they would like to achieve within this space of social learning connected with MOOCs, and three directions came out of that discussion, uh, including um, technology from the area of CSEL referred to as script-based support for collaborative learning, where various forms of scaffolding are provided to groups of learners in order to support them in working effectively together and learning effectively together. Also research on knowledge building, which is also another big sub-community of the computer-supported collaborative learning community that studies how communities of individuals come together to create knowledge. And these can be design communities or communities of scientific discovery. It can be children um, theorizing and trying to make sense of the world around them. But the goal is to create new knowledge that students 
and participants more broadly stimulate each other's creativity and knowledge construction and that they're building on each other's ideas and advancing knowledge together. But another direction was also mobile access to, um, and collaboration on the go. And so these three directions emerged and then we um, uh, worked to get more discussion going to flesh these directions out after that initial meeting and the two directions that had the most critical mass and momentum were those of script-based support and knowledge building and so that's what we're sort of pushing forward with now and I mentioned in my announcement for this talk that I would talk a little bit about the development effort that we have recently formally gotten off the ground here at Carnegie Mellon and one thing that we're doing is we're developing a new discussion forum X block and what we want to build into that is the ability for course developers to introduce uh, into a customizable form of that discussion forum various types of scaffolds which they can um, uh, design and configure in order to have the elements of different kinds of scripts for script-based support and um, in particular kinds of scaffolding that would enable effective knowledge building in that thread of discussion and um, uh, so we are still investigating how we can uh, make this happen we're working on it as we're also exploring more broadly uh, the different ways that we can pull this off from a technical standpoint. So the idea really is to take research that's already been done in other learning settings to make it possible to investigate how this or similar kinds of support um, that has been shown to be effective in the past can be used in a MOOC context, possibly adapted in a MOOC context, in order to support more intensive social interaction around learning. So I want to point out, last time, uh, Piotr Mitros and others at edX were our speakers for the online speaker series. We had a great discussion with them where they were talking about social learning in edX. And in that uh, discussion, they mentioned some resources that already exist and have been used in an edX context for some forms of social learning. And so since that time, we have worked to find those resources. They were not collected together in one organized place, but we have gathered them together, at least the ones that we were able to identify. And that's what you'll find on our resources page. Today, we're having the second talk in the series, and then we have subsequent talks scheduled for July 17th, when Marcella Borges from Penn State will talk about assessment and feedback on group processes, supporting self-directed learning in team-based online courses. And then August 13th, when Chinmay Kulkarni, uh, currently at Stanford University, but who will be coming to Carnegie Mellon University in the fall, will be talking about leveraging global diversity through small group discussions in massive open online courses. And we're extremely excited to be welcoming him here to the faculty in the School of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon so he can be formally collaborating with us on this effort in an intensive kind of way. But we have others lined up to give talks in the future. In particular, Art Gracer has offered to give a talk and also Dragon Geshevish and others, and we just need to schedule those in. So we'll be having additional talks going forward uh, through the fall and probably even forward from there. So if you would like to volunteer to give a talk or if there's someone in particular who you would like to hear in our talk series, just let us know. So here's a picture of our current resources page. We've gathered relevant resources together under four headings. One are X blocks that are particularly focused on collaboration. Uh, others are X blocks for a variety of forms of interactivity. Finally, um, also there are some X blocks that are sort of more infrastructure-y, um, ones that support third-party tool integration in general, <clears throat> which can be useful because there are many third-party tools out there that are open source that could be used to support collaboration. And finally, X blocks that are useful for testing and launching. So you can see here on each of these four pages, um, we're, we're following this format where we have a table that 
um, gives pointers to the various resources that fit under that heading that we have identified. We're contacting the people who are responsible for having developed and are maintaining those resources to get their permission to have them posted from our page. We're testing them to make sure that they're working and we're trying to make an easy uh, link um, to be clicked on um, that, that makes it easy for others also to test those. X blocks in order to decide if they're of interest before actually um, taking time to uh, get them working on their own um, local version of edX or, or whatever it is that, that they're actually um, using to do course development. So we really hope that this will be a valuable resource for the community. And as I said, please let us know if you know of other resources that we have not uh, linked to yet, especially if they're yours, but also uh, if they belong to others, because we really want to make this the go-to place for these kinds of resources. So at CSCL last week, that's the Computer Supported Collaborative Learning Conference in um, Sweden this year, we hosted a, a two-day interactive event. We had about 40 people attending the first session on the first day, about 25 on the second day. You can see pictures here of um, of the, the, the very active engagement that we got from the community at this event. Um, we had talks briefly in the beginning where we talked about especially um, an edX MOOC that was jointly run by George Siemens, Dragon Geshevich, Ryan Baker, and I in the fall where we tried out what we were calling a, a two-layer MOOC structure that involved many forms of social learning and that allowed us to study some of these questions and also to test out some early interventions, some of which I will uh, be discussing today in my talk. And then we engaged the, the community of people who attended and participated in some critiquing and some visioning, and we've collected together the notes, especially from day two, and have made those available through our Google group. So I encourage you to read those and also comment on um, the notes and add your own ideas, because again, we really just want to get as many voices around the table as possible so that we can form a vision that's going to reach uh, the maximum community of people who are interested in this particular uh, area. So big picture issues that emerged from the discussion at the interactive event included ideas like balancing instructivism and constructivism. This idea that there's a, a fundamental tension between um, the idea that the most efficient way of getting information across is in an instructivist kind of way where a teacher imparts the information and students absorb it. Some believe students are not capable of learning this way, but I think we all kind of know from having been in school, well, it's just not true to that stark extent. However, um, maybe it's not as conducive to engagement as more constructivist approaches to learning that try to get the student actively engaged in building knowledge and grappling with the ideas in a more kind of active way. Not that it has to be physically active, but mentally active in processing ideas and, and hopefully interactive between students and instructors or between students and each other in order um, to compare mental models and identify gaps and, and to construct that, that knowledge. Um, in this fundamental tension in a MOOC context, what we end up with is this idea that um, there are these more or less very um, focused, uh, directed forms of instruction that we see very frequently in typical MOOCs, where there's a series of videos and quizzes and assignments that students are instructed to do, and they work through them in a particular order. Now, uh, whether or not most students actually follow that program exactly, that's a separate question. But the idea is that that would be the instructivist approach. And yet another idea is that these resources are just made available. There should be this community in which students can find their own path and the one that's appropriate for them. And no doubt in the MOOC context, we find that there's a variety of a very heterogeneous community of students who are part of these courses. And um, it takes uh, um, a lot of different possible um, paths in order to really meet all of the diverse needs. But to be able to make all of those available is confusing for students. And so uh, how can we balance those things? And also, 
how do we support students moving into that kind of active leadership role? And is there even a role for students to play contributing towards the course content to those students with more expertise or those who have already go gone through the class, have started to apply the knowledge, and now really have something to, to give back? Is there a place for those students to come back and, and make a contribution? And uh, you know, how can we support that path? There's also a tension between meeting diverse needs through heterogeneous experiences, maybe in terms of not at the level of, 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 of path through a course even, but just uh, how do students prefer to a engage in social interaction. Some students prefer interaction in a Twitter kind of um, format. Others might prefer the threaded discussions. Others might prefer more synchronous, intensive communication. And if we offer all these possibilities, then students feel a little bit overwhelmed and confused. And um, we uh, saw this in the comments also that students who participated in our fall MOOC um, made, but, but also many of the, the people who attended the interactive event also said they felt that that would be an issue and, and they were right. Um, there are also big questions about what would be the ideal nature of groups and social interaction in a MOOC context. And of course, there are a lot of factors that have to be taken into account. And as you start to think about this question, you realize that there are so many different kinds of learning that you might want students to engage in. And all of them come with maybe different um, guidelines for what, what would make a good group uh, for that purpose. And so then how do we create affordances that will support groups through this diversity of kinds of learning that we want to be able to support? And so there was a lot of discussion surrounding that. And certainly, we didn't answer those questions. Mostly, if you read the notes, you'll see that it's a about raising these issues and we'll continue to consider these and what we really want to do is make a way for us to explore these questions in multiple contexts so that we start to get an idea of what is the space and what are the parameters that we have to consider when we are taking resources and configuring them for learning in a particular course. So you can see in the discussion forum um, at our discussion forum in Google Groups, we've we've had quite a lot of discussion about social learning in general. We've had discussions about our new Discourse DB data infrastructure. And if you look at the first two threads, those are related to today's talk. There's um, a place where you can uh, raise issues that uh, you think that should be discussed as follow-up from this talk. And um, there's also the notes from the interactive event that I mentioned. So you can add your own ideas to the discussion, and I really encourage you to do so. Okay, so now for the main part of the talk, I meant to talk about the research that my group has been doing, developing interventions for social learning in MOOCs, but that's built on our longtime research in a classroom context, where we've been doing work in computer-supported collaborative learning. And here you can see an example of the kinds of CSCL activities that we have been building and um, offering to students in a variety of courses. This was from a thermodynamics course, but we've done work in, a, in, in, in various engineering courses, math courses, science courses, even psychology, um, uh, and others. Uh, or, uh, so um, in the, uh, these settings, what we do is um, we would take a, a kind of chat client like you see here. This is the um, concert chat environment, but we've done work in really a variety of, of, of different chat clients, including ones that we have developed on our own and also well-established ones like um, Second Life, for example. And um, they, many of these have a very common architecture where clients um, that students each have at, the, at their computer are uh, communicating with one backend server. And so all of the communication is going through one loop that's collected there at the back end. And that's what makes it easy for us to link in our interventions that are able to monitor the interaction in real time because everything that students contribute or do at their client gets run through that same loop and we're able to uh, process that. But then we're also able to pump out um, behaviors to the client uh, uh, interfaces. And so here you can see, if you look in the chat frame, that there are some terms that are labeled as tutor. And those were generated automatically from 
our uh, automated collaborative support from the framework that we refer to as Bazaar and that we also used in our fall MOOC, and I'm going to talk about that, um, an intervention for collaborative reflection. Here, students are working together on um, a design task in a mechanical engineering course, and the agent's goal here is to help the students link conceptual content to the design decisions that they're making and to push deeper for students to think about um, the reasoning behind those concepts and ultimately to connect the concepts to the choices that they're making. So they can reflect on what are the implications uh, for these choices and what would be trade-offs between them. And the hope is that in engaging in that interaction that they uh, get more deeply involved in that conceptual content and end up learning more about those principles through their design activity and that's exactly what we find in our classroom studies. So let me just talk a little bit about our design cycle. It starts with collecting data in realistic um, discussion uh, learning settings and then uh, doing analysis of that data to understand what are the properties of conversation that contribute towards learning, either at a turn level or even properties uh, um, that are measured over an entire conversation or roles or orientations that we identify that students are taking in those interactions. And ultimately what we do is we identify those properties, we model them computationally so that we can monitor those in data in real time during an interaction if desired and then we can also use our measure of those properties or orientations etc cetera, etc cetera, to be able to make predictions about valued outcomes like learning or um, uh, 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 well, commitment to a course or how people feel about their teams or whether knowledge is being communicated um, or transferred from more expert students to less expert students effectively. Once we have uh, collected some data, we've done this modeling, we've done this analysis, we use the findings from our analysis to inform the design of interventions so that we can push beyond what we can learn from correlational analyses and do experimental manipulations that allow us to get at causal connections between the properties of conversation that <clears throat> we identify as valuable and these valuable uh, learning outcomes. And we do this evaluation in the context of real learning settings like classrooms and now in MOOCs and we have about 10 years of results that show uh, that we're able to make a significant impact on student learning during the activities but more recently we've also looked at how the students having participated in these collaborative activities affects the whole class environment when they come back and we do see positive effects and um, I'm certainly happy to talk to people more about that uh, research uh, separately if people are interested. But let's think a little bit more about what is it that we're actually learning about the conversations. So, you know, this talk is about discourse analytics. Well, what does that really mean? Well, um, I want to stretch back a little bit in time to the turn of the century when tutorial dialogue was just starting to have a resurgence of interest. And um, at that time, in addition to building tutorial dialogue agents where the hope was that they would be able to achieve some of the positive effects that we have seen human tutors achieving um, with students, we also needed to understand something about what those conversations should look like. And so there were um, a variety of efforts to model conversations in corpora re where there were lots of conversations between tutors and students paired with learning gains to try to understand what were the properties of tutoring discussions that, that made predictions about learning. Because if we knew what needed to happen in the conversations, we would know better how to design those tutorial dialogue agents. And at that time, in the beginning, it was desirable to adopt measures that were really easy to do reliably um, and quickly. 
And that included general indicators of interactivity, like you know how are turns distributed among people in a group, or how long are turns, or how long is the conversation, or how many questions are students asking, or uh, what's the ratio of student words to tutor words, or how much initiative are students taking. And these things, they're, they're easy to count, and it's possible to tell a story about them, why they should make a prediction about learning. And in any given tutoring study, we're able to find at least one of these shallow measures that makes some prediction about learning. But what we saw was, as we compared these across studies, we didn't find that the same measures predicted learning in a general way across settings. And eventually, we had to come to the conclusion that though these properties of conversation correlate with the important things about conversation that predict learning in some situations, they weren't themselves those things that were valuable, because if that was the case, then there would be more of a general relationship between these properties and learning. And we just didn't see that. And so around that time is when I started to formally get involved in research in computer-supported collaborative learning. And there I became acquainted with researchers like Frank Fisher at the University of Munich. And in that context, um, I became more aware of research in the collaborative learning community on um, collaborative process analysis, which was often conducted by hand, but where the categories were well motivated from theories of collaborative learning and how it works. And so then I began to form partnerships with researchers about taking those very meaningful frameworks and being able to automate those analyses in order to be able to build models of collaborative discussions. I want to just say a little bit in general about the approach that I'm advocating, because it's not very typical in the fields of language technologies to take the approach that I do, but I strongly believe that it's one that's more promising in terms of being able to build models that ultimately help us to explain learning, and also that can be used to dynamically adapt support for learning in um, contexts where students are interacting socially. It starts with an understanding of what are the processes at a psychological level that are important to support. And <clears throat> so that comes out of fields of social psychology and cognitive psychology from there's a lot that's already understood in those realms about making groups work and helping people to construct knowledge. And so those are the things that we want to support. Those are the things that are more close to actually achieving outcomes. And the conversation is sort of a means to an end. And so we want to be able to understand how this data that's visible to us relates to the underlying processes that are what's really going on. And so the field of sociolinguistics um, has a lot of wisdom when it comes to the idea of how you look at language, and you see how these psychological processes are reflected through the language choices that people make. And what you understand from digging into the literature in that field is how complex and um, contextual these connections are. And that's why a lot of work in that area is qualitative. Um, and there's this difficult tension between um, wanting to have some general principles that allow us to analyze conversation more generally and understanding um, that there's just so much that varies and that's contextual and that's confounded in particular settings and is the reason why many people go to a qualitative style, is the reason why it's so difficult to do quantitative research well, why it is that we wring our hands and spend a lot of time deliberating over our experimental designs and hashing and rehashing the um, results of our analyses. But there's a nice dialectic between these two research communities, and the, that literature is very rich. and. Um, it's frustrating in some sense to a language technologies um, researcher because we look at that literature and we say, well, I understand now why it's so hard, but I still don't know how to build my model. Yeah, that's true, but at least it, it gets us pointed in the right direction, asking the right questions, understanding the trade-offs that we're making. So layered on top of that is the field of language technologies as we practice it where what we're trying to do is use machinery from computational modeling approaches to be able to uh, leverage these findings that come out of the field of sociolinguistics so that we can, at least to some extent, 
monitor for these kinds of language choices that are there that are the visible representation of the processes that we're really trying to get an estimate of. And so the hope is that in building rich models that leverage these insights from researchers that really spend their time understanding the underlying processes and really digging into the data, that we can build more effective models that will ultimately be more successful at our task. So we have uh, a lot of research over the past uh, several years where we have developed models to be able to do a variety of process and state measurements that you can see listed on this screen. And I'm happy to share any of these papers with anyone who's interested. At the end of this talk is a list of some very recent work that's been published in my group that's related specifically to MOOCs, but not all of the research that's listed on this page is that. And um, so if you see a heading here that seems interesting to you, just ask me and I will pass those papers on to you. We have also done work in taking those basic measurements of uh, processes and states and connecting them with outcomes. And we've looked at things like information transfer within groups, learning, and then most recently, attrition. So we've done a lot of research in the recent couple of years on how we can understand how um, how properties of conversations make predictions about attrition along the way in MOOCs. I want to point out that uh, in my lab we have developed a tool bench for being able to build computational models of text. It really just helps facilitate the development of supervised learning models. It offers uh, functionality for being able to extract a variety of kinds of features from text, to be able to integrate text features with non-text features, to be able to build structure into models um, uh, in order to accommodate heterogeneity in a data set that you might want to make sure that you build into your model in order not to get biased estimates. Uh, it also supports a process of iterative development of models for making predictions from text. And here we see um, a graphical representation of that iterative process that we advocate, not just um, uh, doing a, a reasonable uh, setting up of a model and, 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 and sort of believing um, that the machine learning is going to do all the work for us, but understanding that we're going to take what we understand about the language, we're going to use that to develop a representation in terms of the features that we extract that allow us to find the clues that come from what we can learn about the language choices that we can uh, see visibly in text that we want to be able to use to make predictions, but then to use um, our tool to help us find what ended up being weak or confusing to the machine learning algorithms in um, the data so that we can build more effective representations um, through which these machine learning models will have more success at making the, the predictions that we're interested in. So I just want to point out, this is the interface for doing error analysis in our LightSide tool. And uh, you can read the user's manual. It will lead you step by step how to make use of the resources that it provides. But I just want to kind of highlight this process where having trained a model, you can select it. Then you can see what kind of confusions are happening most frequently. And then when you decide which ones you want to be able to investigate, it will give you kind of its estimate of which features are potentially most problematic. And then it gives you the ability to dig back into the data to see where are those features showing up in the data and what other text is around where those features are occurring so that you can reason about why those features ended up being confusing to the model. And that's meant to help you um, come up with an idea of how you can improve the model making it more effective in terms of the representation of, of the data. So this is really just a very brief discussion about this really important part of the iterative process of developing a model of, of how to identify certain properties and states in language. I encourage you, if you're interested, to download the tool, try it out yourself. Um, work through the tutorial and the user's manual, and if you want to know more, again, contact me and I will point you to more resources. 
And now I'll just talk a little bit about what we've learned through our analyses about factors that lead to dropout along the way in MOOCs. And so what we do as part of our process is that first we have to be able to take the conversational data that we collect in a MOOC context, we have to be able to make these process and state measurements at time points. And then what we do is we use a survival model in order to be able to make a measurement of how those measures of process and state um, variables make predictions about dropout at a time point. So you can see here um, that uh, this survival curve that gets drawn from the model is what represents what we can learn from the data about how dropout is happening over time in a data set. On the x-axis, we see a representation of time that starts from the beginning of a student's participation in a course, regardless of what week of the course it is when a student joins. And then we, make, uh, we look at behavior in each week, and then we also have um, uh, on the y-axis a measure of the probability that a student is still part of the course at the next time point. And so this blue line that you see is kind of the average dropout over time that we see in students. And then what we do is um, look at, the model looks at how the variance in these time varying process and state measures makes a prediction at a time point about the likelihood that a student is still involved in the course at the next time point. And so within this model, um, rather than predicting the length of a student's participation in the course, we have multiple observations of students. And so it's a hierarchical model where all of the data points belonging to a single student are tied formally in the model so that we don't get biased estimates from that um, non-independence of the observations that are within the uh, data. And so then what we see here is that a line that's more shallow is associated with a variable whose measure when it's uh, a standard deviation higher than average um, is associated with a certain rate of slowdown or speed up in the um, rate at which people are dropping out. So in other words, uh, an increase in probability that a student dropped out at the next time point or decrease. So a more shallow line means that there's a decrease in probability of dropout, a more um, curved line, um, you know, like a stronger curve, like the dotted line at the bottom uh, represents an increase in uh, dropout rate. And so you can see here, this is related to an analysis of cognitive engagement and motivation in, um, in a particular course. This was a teacher professional development course. And you can see in the upper uh, right-hand corner uh, the formal output of the model where we have hazard ratios that come out of our survival model that tell us about how factors are related to increase or decrease in dropout rate over the community average. And first we have some control variables. So we have here cohort one. What that means is it's a binary variable that tells you whether a student was had joined the course in the first week when it was opened because students who join in the first week we have seen over virtually all of the courses that we have examined have a lower rate of dropout in general. And you can see here that uh, they have about a 32% uh, percent lower rate of dropout on average than the, than the average other students in the course. Post count by user is also a measure of engagement in the course or commitment to the course. It, it means that the student is more active, and you can see that those more active students, based on the hazard ratio, are 14% uh, less likely to drop out than the ones who are less active. But then we have our two variables of interest, and that's the average motivation level exhibited in the post from a student on a particular week, and the average cognitive engagement level also exhibited by students on the week. And these curves that you see are represented as students who are high in both on a week or students who are low on both in a week. And you can see that when students are high on motivation and cognitive engagement, they're less likely to drop out. And when they're low, they're much more likely to drop out. And so what we see from this is that we can monitor this on a week-by-week -week basis and get a sense of which students are more vulnerable to drop out. And that's really what we learn from these survival analyses. So we use this as a paradigm in our research for being able to try to 
go from our modeling of what's in the conversation to hypotheses about how we might support students. It's also important to look at how this might change over different courses. So here you can see we've done the same analysis in three different MOOCs. One is that teacher professional development one I just mentioned, but there's also uh, the fantasy and science fiction literature kind of course, and also a learning to program Python programming course. And here you can see that across these three courses, we see a similar pattern that high motivation and cognitive engagement is associated with less dropout and low is associated with more dropout. But you can see if you look at the hazard ratios that the ranking between these two different measures is different in terms of the strength of the effect depending upon the course. And as we looked at the data, it, it became clear that there was a lot that was kind of um, complicated. So let me just give you a, a little taste of that. One uh, thing was about um, measures of cognitive engagement, which come from uh, measures of how many abstract words we see in the discussion that students are engaging in. In some courses, like a programming course that's very concrete, when we see the use of lots of these abstract terms, it really says something about how students are thinking conceptually and making abstractions. In another course, like a literature course, there's much more of that abstract discussion anyway, even just in discussing the details of some story or some novel that, uh, that, that, that students have read. And so so it means less. And so then you see that, um, that there the, we have a stronger effect of uh, expressed motivation. In particular, uh, we see uh, an 18% um, reduction in attrition when uh, expressed motivation is uh, a standard deviation higher, but only an 8%. Uh, reduction when average cognitive engagement is measured as high, and part of that is because uh, the model has trouble distinguishing for that course between what really shows cognitive engagement and just abstraction that's, um, you know, just discussing the details of, 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 of a book that doesn't require the student actually making an abstraction. So these are the kinds of things that we end up getting into when we're doing this discourse analytics. And it's what makes this very rich, but also tricky. And so again, I think uh, a message I'd like to get across is um, that it's important for discourse analysis to be treated with great care and to take time to really look at what is this model telling me about my data? What is it picking up about the data that's here? Uh, you know, am I seeing consistency? Is the consistency I see actually telling me the same thing? These kinds of questions are really important to hash over. And I wouldn't by any means try to put our work forward as, as really the be all and end all in this space, but we're just shooting for this model of basing on the foundation, the psychological processes, building on top of that insights that we um, that we glean from mostly fields of discourse analysis and sociolinguistics and using that to motivate our models. It's a continuing effort for us that we're really working towards being able to achieve this and we're taking steps in that direction, but really there's still a lot of work to be done in that direction. So another thing that we have spent a lot of time looking at in MOOCs is measures of confusion. And what we see is that, not surprisingly, um, higher measures of confusion are associated with higher dropout, lower measures of confusion with lower dropout. We also see that participating in discussions where confusion is being expressed by others is associated with dropout, probably because students participate in those discussions if they had their own confusion. And we also see that um, actually um, the fact that a student is participating in a discussion with other confused people makes a stronger prediction about dropout than the student's own expressed confusion. And we think what that means is that the students who participate in those discussions but don't express their own confusion are trying to get their needs met indirectly through having read and responded or participated in other discussions, but because they haven't articulated their own need, that their, their needs are not being fully met. And so then we actually see that that confusion not having been expressed hasn't been dealt with as well as it could be. And so then we see a stronger negative effect of that confusion. 
Uh, we also see a partly mitigating effect of students getting help either from fellow students or from their teacher, but that doesn't completely mitigate the negative effect of the confusion. And um, so we're still grappling with what that means, but again, we suspect partly that students are not actually reaching out for all of the help that they need, or they're getting help, but they're not, they're not completely getting their needs met. Um, all of these analyses are discussed in detail in papers that have been published now, and so I think in the interest of keeping the talk short, I'm not going to pick through these hazard ratios, but uh, I encourage people to refer to the papers, and again, if you're not able to find them, go ahead and contact me and I will make sure that you get copies of those. So with findings like this, and this is really just a taste of the analyses that we have been working on like this in MOOC context, we have developed some interventions that are based on these findings. And in particular, we, um, based on the finding of the value of cognitive engagement, have developed an intervention that supports collaborative reflection with the idea that we're offering um, increased opportunities for students to engage in this kind of abstraction and reflection behavior. We, um, and based on the idea that students are not necessarily articulating all of their confusion and also that confusion has a negative effect, we've introduced a quick helper in order to try to increase the success with which students get help when they, they do reach out for it. So let me talk first about our bizarre intervention. This is the collaborative reflection intervention based on our earlier work on using conversational agents as dynamic support for collaborative learning in online um, group collaboration exercises like you saw earlier with uh, the thermodynamics design activity. And what happened in the MOOC context is that students, this was the MOOC that George Siemens was the head instructor for. I was also one of the co-instructors, but then my group also was working on um, deploying these interventions in the midst of the course. So in each week of the course, students would work through individually some material, and then they would get to the place in the set of weekly activities where they were meant to engage in a collaborative chat, and so they would click on this button that you see in the upper left that would try to uh, get them initiated into one of these exercises. They would go to, that would lead them to our lobby program where once they have entered, we try to match them with another student who's logged in at the same time, if there is such a student. And if we're able to match them with another student, then you can see at the bottom, we provide the two students with a link to a chat room that we have created for them. Then they click on that link, they enter the chat room, and here's what they see. Um, a conversational agent, in this case called Virtual Carolyn, gives them some um, reflection prompts that they can use to structure the conversation. And uh, we did find that this intervention was effective at giving students the opportunity to engage in the kind of um, reasoning and abstraction that we wanted to be able to see. Um, we saw that there was a higher concentration of reasoning in these collaborative chats than we saw either in um, the threaded discussion forums or in Twitter, which were two other uh, opportunities that students had in that course for social engagement. We also saw that there was uh, a higher incidence of discussion about the actual course content, either in Twitter or in the chats than in the discussion forums. But in, in Twitter, though, they were discussing the course content. They were mostly um, sharing resources, links to things that they had found on the web that were good supporting materials, but not really engaging in reflection together. So that was kind of uniquely part of the experience that they had in the collaborative chat. And as we um, performed a survival analysis, we found some evidence that having participated in these chats led to a substantial reduction in attrition around the time points where students participated in them. And um, I refer you again to the paper where, um, where the full analysis is um, published because uh, I think in interest of time, I'm not going to pick through all that at this moment. Um, but also uh, there's a little bit of pickiness in order to 
uh, be able to be confident about this effect. It's, and again, only a correlational analysis. And going forward, we plan to do uh, more experimental manipulations in order to identify whether using these opportunities for collaborative discussion actually causes a reduction in attrition. So that would be research we still need to do. So the quick helper that was meant to address the problem of confusion in a MOOC context. For this, we have um, placed on each content page uh, a button like you see here that looks very much like uh, a button to make a post in an edX discussion forum. And in fact, that is exactly what it is. But they don't; students don't have to go to a different uh, part of the course infrastructure to engage in the discussion forum. It's situated on their content page. And I think that was part of what students really liked about it. But um, what it was really meant to do was, in addition to students posting their, um, their help request to the discussion forum, it would um, uh, offer other uh, opportunities. So what would happen is the students would type in their message. It would get posted to the discussion forum. But then it would also get passed to a back end server that would match the help request with some helpers from the community that had been identified as active and having participated in discussions on a similar topic before. Um, and then it would offer to invite those students to participate on the thread. And so um, part of doing that would be to generate an, an email message automatically, like you see on the upper left here on the screen, that includes a link that students can click to to go from their email into the discussion forum right away exactly to that thread where the help request is. And so it mentions to them that this would be an opportunity for them to offer some help. So before that email is sent to any helpers, the student who posted the help request sees this preview and also what you see on the bottom left, which is a list of three selected helpers um, where the student gets to check off which ones they want to invite to their thread. And here we did an experimental manipulation to see how uh, features about how those helpers are presented to students affect their willingness uh, to invite them to come to their thread. And that's what you see here on the right. Uh, my graduate student, Iris Howley, was applying expectancy value theory to this manipulation to motivate the different elements of how students were uh, presented as helpers in order to investigate how that theory of cost-benefit analysis plays out in a MOOC context. And once we understand how students are doing that kind of social problem solving around help seeking in this environment, then we'll know more about how to present these opportunities to students so that they feel more comfortable asking for the help that they need. Now, once students have selected one or more helpers, those emails are sent to the students automatically. And the hope is then that students who post help requests will get a response more quickly. Now, um, it turns out that because the MOOC that we deployed this in was relatively small and the teachers were very active, we didn't get a good read on whether this actually increased the um, success of help requests getting responded to because the teachers and other students were so active in actually answering the requests. This is definitely not the typical case that we have seen in MOOCs, and so in a future deployment study, we hope, we'll get a better read on uh, the extent to which this actually did make um, help getting uh, more effective. But what we did see is that over the course, um, there was an increasing usage of quick helper for engaging in the forums instead of just going directly to the discussion forums. OK. Well, that was all I had planned to cover. Um, when I did this in the Google Hangout, uh, the problem with uh, with how we were doing it is uh, something got stuck in the Google Hangout on the air in terms of the, the uh, slides being projected. There was a short discussion after the, the talk. Um, some of those questions were posted to the discussion uh, forum. And uh, so I would encourage you to go and engage in discussion there or email me your questions, because I would be very, very happy to talk to you about anything that was of interest to you in this talk. And thank you very much for your patience. And for any of you who were there this morning when we were having technical difficulties, again, I apologize. <laughs>